welcome back to Dorset Shoals Wednesday Night Live. I know we've taken a couple of weeks off as we had our Holy Week services on one week and I was out of town last week, but we are going to jump back in and we're going to be jumping back in with a new series I'm going to be talking about and it's kind of why we believe what we believe as Christians. Because one of these things we want to look at and see what are some of the tenets of our faith, what are some of the things that really help to shape our faith. And so today, we're going to talk about one of the biggest things, of course, that shapes our faith, and that is the Scriptures. And in 2 Timothy 3, 16-17, it says this, All Scripture is inspired by God and beneficial for teaching, for rebuke, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man or woman of God may be fully capable, equipped for every good work. And so, of course, we have the scriptures that show us what it means to be a Christian, what it's supposed to be, how we're supposed to do the things. It shows us what we are to do, as it talks about giving us correction and rebuke, you know, rebuking us from those behaviors we shouldn't do, correcting us from the behaviors we didn't know we shouldn't be doing, teaching us. And it's so central to our faith. It's one of these things that we look at, and it's such a core part of what it means to be a Christian We really need to understand it. But I think a lot of people, when they look at Scripture, they don't really understand it or don't exactly know all the things about it. They just think that maybe sometimes it just showed up somehow. I mean, we need to understand how the Bible was written. So the first thing we're going to look at is some of the theories on how the Bible was written. Because, of course, the Bible was written by man. But it was written by inspiration of the Holy Spirit as God led men to write it. But one of the questions we have is, well, how did they do that? Was it just something where they mindless, you know, or they do this, or did they just kind of, I think this is what God wants me to say? So there's a couple of theories about that. So we're going to take a look at that. That's going to be the first thing we're going to look at is how was the Bible written? How were the writers inspired? Well, again, another scripture shows us this in 2 Peter 1.21. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. And so the big key right there is moved by the Holy Spirit. So we can understand that, that when we see something from God, it's got to be moved by the Holy Spirit. And a picture that would be used to show this moved by the Holy Spirit would be the sail of a sailing ship. And the sailing ship goes nowhere until the wind blows on the sail and the sail pulls the ship along in essence. And so what we see here is that men were pulled along by the Holy Spirit. But exactly how were they pulled along? This is where people have debate. This is where people disagree. And so there's four different theories that people put forth about how on earth that men did this. And so we're going to take a look at them, take a look at some of their strengths and weaknesses, and then see where we probably should land on when we look at some of these. Well, the first theory is called the dictation theory. And in the dictation theory, essentially what it is, is God dictated his word to these writers. It was just straight to them. Their personalities and their human error could not interfere with God's intended message. So it was just, you know, a blind thing. You know, the person in the Old Testament, person in the New Testament, no personality to them whatsoever. It's just you are essentially a human typewriter. And so that's the dictation theory is that essentially they were just God's They were the hand that wrote down what God told them to write. Now, the strengths of this uh, view is, number one, God's word has a high protective value. That we would look and say, okay, this really, you know, solidifies that, hey, these words are God's, that God did this without any mixture from anybody else, anything like that. However, that does lead to a weakness where, when we look at this dictation theory because it does not explain the personalities of the writers being included. Because when you read it, you can look and you can see the different personalities of each writer as it comes through there. And so that is a particular weakness of it. Um, It also does not explain, it it might explain certain portions of scripture, but not all of it. Um, And so that's one of the things we look at as a weakness from this dictation theory of there's things in the Bible that we look at, we say, okay, that's obviously some personality uh, of the writer or that they're writing to certain groups, things like that, that come out. And so the dictation theory is one that we see that we would look at saying, uh, I'm not so sure about that one. Probably see some elements of it, but it, it, there are some very big weaknesses that kind of to strike us. Um, the second one, and this one, <laughs> I'm not going to be able to hide uh, my, my feelings about this one. It's called the new, Neo-Orthodox, uh, and of course Neo being new, the New Orthodox Theory. This is what uh, some people are thinking today. 
And uh, in this theory, uh, a couple of things about it, highlights of it, is that the only way that we can know God is through direct revelation. And this is not general revelation like we see through nature. Um, direct revelation would be what God says to you in particular. So, you know, it, you could really disregard anything that happened to anyone else. Only God speaks to you, and that's the only way you know it's God. Um, of course, this is going to mean that the Bible is denied as the Word of God. The Bible is not God's Word, but fallible words written by fallible men. And God can sometimes, however, use the words of the Bible to speak to individuals, but He's not beholden to it. Um, you could see this, you know, we look at the strengths, and, and bear with me when I say this is a strength, because I don't believe it's a strength, but the world would look at this in a non-biased effort and say, well, strength of it um, is the world that wants to reject Scripture loves this theory. You know, I don't have to do what the Bible says because it was written by fallible men. It's a fallible book. I only have to believe what God says to me. Um, and so the thing about it, God's revelation can be found anywhere, um, including my own thoughts. You know, my own thoughts suddenly become godly. And so, of course, we can see why the world would love this. You know, non-believers would love this because it's like, okay, yeah, I don't have to listen to the Bible. I don't have to. I can dismiss it and just use my own opinion, say it's God's will, and I'm good to go. Um, a weakness of this, of course, is there's no inspiration to the scriptures at all. There's no inspiration about what God's telling us to do. It's simply just whatever we want to do. Um, God's word has no more merit than the words of Charles Dickens. And so um, you can probably feel what I think about the neo-Orthodox. Um, again, I think this is just an absolute uh, travesty, um, heresy, I would almost say, uh, about them just saying that the Bible has absolutely zero inspiration to it and should be disregarded. I disagree with that vehemently. Okay, let's go on to something that might have a little more into it at least. And the third one is, is called the limited inspiration theory. And what this limited inspiration theory is that the Bible is man's work, but with a little help from God. You know, man did the writing, but God did a little work with it. Um, he even allowed errors. Um, some are factual or historical, uh, but the Holy Spirit prevented doctrinal errors. So the doctrine of the Bible is correct and inerrant. However, the uh, facts, you know, historical facts, things like that, not a big deal. You know, that's not true and everything like that. Um, a strength of this, it can explain supposed errors or hard to understand concepts because you can just say, oh, well, it is an error. You know, oh, when the, when the uh, one, one gospel says one angel and the other gospel says two angels, well, then obviously it was just a, it was just a mistake and so no big deal. You know, and it's like, wait a minute, you've got to really dig down here. Um, so there's the strength of that, the weakness. Um, it, it is so full of errors. If there's errors, how can it be trusted? If it has errors in it, you can't trust it. I mean, that, that's the big thing about it. The reliability of the word would be questionable at best. So limited um, inspiration, I don't think we can really look at very strongly as well. Well, in most Christians, in most groups that take a look at it, and we as Southern Baptists, we look at it, and we take option number four, which is the verbal plenary inspiration theory. And what this is, is that the inspiration uh, to the words themselves, not just the idea of the concepts. This is the idea that, hey, these inspiration comes all the way down to the words, the very words of Scripture are inspired, not just the ideas or the concepts, which is sometimes what people like to say is, well, the concept of salvation, but not the words of salvation in the Bible. And so we need to really make a look at that. Um, personal expressions were guided by and protected under the Holy Spirit. We know the personality of the writers were in the scriptures, and we look at this and say, well, it was guided by and protected. You know, there were certain things that it's okay. It's okay for this personality trait to come out. No, we're not going to do that. The Holy Spirit is going to lead you and guide you. Uh, the strengths of this is that it explains the personality of the writers being present. It also gives a high view of God's words, the very words of God, you know, that he didn't just put in filler material. There wasn't stuff in there. Everything has a reason for it being there. That's a strength. And then a weakness of it, this can lead to incorrect interpretation if not exegeted correctly. And I think this is where we are, uh, people who don't want to exegete the scriptures. Because again, using my example where we talk about in one gospel it says one angel, in the other gospel it says two angels, okay, that's just a difference in eyewitness. That's just a difference in this person saw this, this person saw something different. Uh, you know, if you had people who were witnessing a, an accident or something like that, you're going to see eyewitnesses who are going to witness something different. It doesn't mean that either one is wrong. 
you know, if I'm looking over here and my blind, my eyes is, are guarded from here and I can't see the other one, hey, there's one. Where this person who saw both, oh, there's two. You know, it's not a, it's not a error. It's not a contradiction. It's just a different in viewpoint that they saw it differently. And so there's no problem there. But people, of course, want to try to spin it that there is. So the verbal plenary and her inspiration is where we would fall and look at this, where most traditional conservative Christians would fall onto, is that God has protected his word. There is personality in it, and it has a high view for our lives. Okay, so let's go ahead. We're going to quickly do this. Got a couple of questions for you here. Number one, does it matter how the Bible was written? When you look into your faith and you see it, does it matter how the Bible was written? And then the second question, how should a Christian approach supposed errors in the scriptures? Okay, so y'all talk about those nice, easy, simple questions, and we'll be right back. Well, I hope you, you answered those questions so easily that you can teach a course on it now because those are such easy questions about the inspiration of Scripture. But we do know that it is important for the Scripture to be inspired, that we do need to look at this because if it is not inspired, if it's just a book that anybody can write, well, then it really doesn't mean anything. And so we could just dismiss it. We could just put it to the side and say, well, well who cares? But because we know it's inspired, because we look at it and view it as inspired, we look and say, okay, it's the words of God. And so we look and say, okay, well, Steve, that's nice. That's a good thought. But what is the evidence of inspiration? Well, I think there's plenty of things of evidence for inspiration. So let's take a look. Matthew 5, 17 through 18 says this. Do not presume that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke of a letter shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. Now this, of course, is Jesus speaking of, in essence, the Old Testament, saying that, hey, it's not gone away. There's nothing about it that's gone away. You know, yes, grace has covered certain things, but yeah, you don't dismiss it. You don't say, okay, well, that's not real anymore. You know, it's not going to pass away until all is accomplished, which, of course, he is going to accomplish it on the cross. But Jesus here has a very high view of Scripture, and Jesus is holding to the Scripture, which we'll talk about in just a minute. But I think there's lots of evidence for the inspiration of Scripture, and so we'll take a look at them and, and just see. Number one is the fulfilled prophecies. When we look at the prophecies that were postulated in the Old Testament and then brought forward to the New Testament, there's over 300 prophecies concerning Jesus' first coming, and they've all been fulfilled. I mean, and these were not written at the same time, or these were not written after the fact. It's like, oh, we need to jump back 100 years or so and write these into the Old Testament so that it matches what happened in the New Testament. That's not what happened at all. These were books that were written hundreds of years before the prophecies came true. 
And so we can look at fulfilled prophecy and see an inspiration of Scripture because man can't do that. Man can't make it up. Only God who knows the future, only God who knows all of time and space is able to sit there and do this. So there's one evidence of inspiration is just the fulfilled prophecy of it. Um, another evidence of the inspiration is the unity of the Scripture, the unity of the Bible. As we look at it from the beginning to the end, you know, there were 40 different authors over 1,600 years on three different continents. But yet there is a cohesiveness throughout the whole book of the Bible. They were written by diverse men with diverse things going on, with, with very different uh, circumstances going on in their life. But yet it still has a cohesiveness all the way through it. And there's a central theme of the Bible that's always present. You know, from the very beginning to the end, that central theme is always there of redemption, of God's love, of God bringing us back home to him. And so, you know, if you say, hey, I wrote a book, you know, and two, two years later, someone else wrote a book very similar, and two years later, someone wrote a book similar, we might look at it and say, well, a span of six years, probably not a big deal, but a span of over 1,600 years, and not like it's, you know, done in a vacuum where everything's perfect. No, there were wars going on. There were captivities going on. There were all kinds of things happening, but yet the Bible still has this cohesiveness and a unity that goes all the way through it. So I look at that as a evidence of inspiration. Another way I look at the, uh, the evidence of inspiration is that the biblical heroes are really presented honestly. Um, when we look at the heroes of the Bible, we can't really hardly think of any other than Jesus but, of course, Jesus is God, you can't really look at any and just see, oh, wow, they were fine, outstanding, they did nothing wrong. No, they were presented honestly. They were presented as, you know, when we think of David, David was, yes, a man after God's own heart who, you know, who took a wife uh, in adultery, who murdered her husband, who did all kinds of horrible things. We think of Abraham and how he, you know, so many times fell to the, you know, oh, she's not my wife, she's my sister, you know, obvious lies. We look at Jacob, as we've been talking about on Sunday mornings for a while, you know, here's Jacob who absolutely, you know, here's this man who just continually would waver back and forth, waffle back and forth between uh, God and, and, and faith and things of that nature. The disciples were shown to be, you know, men who did not do the right thing all the time. There's a very big honesty to the scriptures, and I can only think that the inspiration of God would do that because God's not going to mix in any air. He's not going to try to blow smoke up on anybody. He's going to absolutely give the truth. We also see the elevation of women um, in the scriptures, and that went against the cultural norm at the time. And so we see you know, these heroes are presented honestly. They're not sugar-coated, and the truth is not sugar-coated, and their characters are not sugar-coated because they're real people. And so we see the inspiration of Scripture showing us the truth of that. And then another one we see is the archaeological findings. You know, one of the big things, I remember Dr. Dukes, a hero of mine who has recently passed and, and gone to be with the Lord, um, he did archaeology. You know, after teaching and after all that, he would go to Israel and help dig up archaeological sites and stuff. And it was so neat because they would find things they, they found uh, towns and cities uh, where people in the, the scriptures had been identified. Here's a town here. And historians, oh, no, there's no city there. There's no city there. And then they would dig down deeper and, it, oh, yep, here it is. Here's the evidence. And this happened over and over and over. And we see how science has been subordinate to scripture. Now, we have a world today that wants to say, oh, no, 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 you know, scripture is subordinate to science. But no, science is subordinate to Scripture because we see in uh, verses like Isaiah 40, 22, when all the world was thinking that the earth was flat, what did the Scripture say? Uh, the Scripture said that God sits on the circle of the earth, the sphere of the earth. So here we see Scripture even pointing to a scientific fact before the science of the time said that, oh, no, no, it's flat. The science of the time said it's flat. The Scripture said, nope, it's a sphere. And so we have to understand that science is subordinate to the Scripture. And so we see the archaeological findings. We see science, all of this pointed into the evidence of inspiration for the Scriptures. And then the final thing that I look at as evidence of inspiration for Scripture is the witnesses that attest to it. Uh, we look at Moses and the prophets and Paul and the New Testament writers who talk about the Scriptures, who use it as authoritative, who use it as inspired. But the biggest one, of course, is Jesus. We saw it at the very beginning in Matthew where he talked about, hey, this isn't going to pass away. 
you know, until it is accomplished. And again, he accomplished it at the cross. But he's like, he used the scripture as authoritative. He viewed the scripture as inspired. And so when we have people in the world who want to look and sit there and say, well, Jesus was a good teacher. He was a good man, but he wasn't God. And the scriptures aren't inspired. Well, you're a good teacher. You know, you want to try to spin that on Jesus. He said the scriptures were inspired. He treated them as if they were inspired by God. So if your good, great teacher did, probably you ought to look into it a little deeper. And so we see that Jesus especially used scriptures and grounded everything he did in the teachings of the scriptures. And so I think we see evidence of inspiration for the scriptures all over the place. And so again, when we look and we see this and see it as inspired by God, it leads us to some very important points. Okay, so I've got a couple of questions for you here. Number one, why is inspiration of the scriptures so important? Why is that so important for us to know? That God inspired it and it wasn't just the work of man. And then secondly, can you be a Christian and not believe in the inspiration of Scripture? Okay? Got a nice, easy question for you there. Start some debate, possibly. All right? Well, y'all talk about that, and we'll be back with just a minute. I want us to kind of take a look because I, I know y'all have answered some questions about this and we might have even might have answered it or even danced around it a little bit but why is inerrancy important to believe when we look at the scriptures as saying there is no error it is inspired by the word it is inspired by God why is that so important to believe well the first thing I think that we look at why it's important to believe is because the Bible claims to be perfect and there's a couple of scriptures here we see. Psalm 12, 6, it says this, The words of the Lord are pure words, like silver refined in a furnace on the ground, purified seven times. The words of the Lord are pure words. Uh, Psalm 19, 7, The law of the Lord is perfect, receiving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is pure, making wise, the, is sure, making wise the simple. And so we see, again, it just start, comes out and says, The law of the Lord is perfect. And then in Proverbs 30, 30, verse 5, it says this, Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. The Bible makes an extraordinary claim about itself. And, you know, I know a lot of people say, well, you can't claim authority from yourself. But when you're claiming and saying, okay, it's a perfect word, that means something. It really puts a high target on you. You know, I remember Deion Sanders, who was a very good football player, very cocky, you know, and he would um, very uh, verbose. He was very uh, confident in himself. Let's just say it that way. He would talk to people and he said, I can do this. I can do this. Nine times out of 10, he could, but he still wasn't perfect. And people noticed that. People talked about that. They, yeah, you know, yeah, you're, you're good, but you're not perfect. Well, here is the Bible who makes a claim about itself that, yeah, it's perfect. And so it really leans itself to scrutiny. And so when we have to understand why is it important to believe, well, the Bible believes it. The Bible says that it is. And if the Bible says it is and we dismiss that, then what are we doing? 
And so we have to really be sure to understand, okay, if the Bible claims it to be perfect, then we need to really delve into it and see. Another reason why we believe that inerrancy is important to believe is that the Bible stands or falls as a whole. You know, you can't sit there and say, <clears throat> excuse me, you can't sit there and say, you know, well, I like this part. I like the salvation part. I don't like this part where it tells me I have to live a certain way. I like this part that tells me he loves everybody. I don't like this part that says those who engage in this behavior are going to hell. You know, I don't like that. So I'm going to pick and choose. Well, think about it this way. If you had a newspaper that contained errors that was, you know, this was wrong, this was wrong, this was wrong, you wouldn't trust that paper. You'd be like, wait a minute, there's too many errors. You, you, you're not right on these things. I cannot trust your reporting. If a document is to be trusted, it must be factual. You know, and so we have to see that it stands or falls as a whole. If the Bible is incorrect or inaccurate in geology, why should we trust its theology? So every aspect of Scripture holds upon itself. And so, again, why is it important for us to believe the inerrancy? We can't believe that, well, they were wrong here, but they're right here. You know, they're wrong on this part, but right here. We can't do that. It's not factual. We're not going to be able to do it. I think this is, again, why so many people try to attack the Bible and say it's inaccurate. Another reason why it is important for us to believe in the inerrancy of Scripture is that the Bible is a reflective of its author. And who is its ultimate author? We've already talked about how the Bible was written, how he used the writers to write it, but the Bible was written by God. And if there's error and fallibility in the Scriptures, then we look and we say, okay, you know, hey, well, God obviously must be wrong too, and if God's wrong, he ain't God. And so we just look at that. Another thing, and this is one of those big things why inerrancy is so important, is the Bible judges us, not us judging the Bible. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, it says this, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. The Bible is the one that judges us, but yet we have flipped it around to try to judge the Bible. The Bible shows us the criteria, what we are to live, how we are to live. But we see the world today that wants to dismiss the Scriptures, wants to get rid of it. And if we can get rid of the inerrancy of it, then we don't have to listen to it. So we see that so much today because we want to judge the Bible instead of the Bible judging us. And then also we see that, again, the Bible must be taken as a whole. There's no picking and choosing of our theology. You cannot throw out the parts you don't like. It is all inclusive, all of it meaning the same thing as it goes through. And then finally, the Bible is the basis for our belief. You know, it's one thing that I'm so proud of to be a Southern Baptist is that we continually hold to the Word of God. And it's getting harder and harder to do that. Now, not as a Baptist, not as a Southern Baptist, it's not hard to do. But as the world looks at us and diminishes us, makes fun of us, calls us bigots, calls us all these things, sexist, homophobe, transphobe, whatever, and it's just like, wait a minute, I'm going to stand on the Word of God, and that's what we're going to do. And if I'm the last person in the world who stands on the Word of God and everybody's outside my house, you know, telling me I'm hateful, well, that's what I'm going to be, I guess, because I'm going to trust in the Word of God because I do believe in the inerrancy of it. I do believe it is the literal, actual words of God that tells me how I am to live my life. Okay? So we see why inerrancy is important because if we take these things out, if we just pick and choose, if we just say, well, God is, you know, fallible, incorrect, um, the Bible, you know, this part's right, but this part's wrong, you know, this little thing is wrong, this word is right, you know, then the basis of our belief is one of fallacy. And it becomes a shaking sand instead of the solid rock. All right. So I got a couple of questions here for you. What happens to Christian beliefs if inerrancy is dismissed? If we just dismiss it, say, that's ah, not. Anyway, we got denominations that are doing this. No, nope, the Bible's not real. You don't have to worry about it. Genesis is just allegory. You don't have to do it. What's happening to Christian beliefs now? And then the second question, got another easy one for you here. Does a person have to believe the Bible is inerrant to be saved? All right? See, so I'll talk about that for just one moment. We'll be right back with our final segment.
Well, I do hope you had good discussion here. And I know this was a uh, an interesting conversation. I hope that you really did enjoy this lesson. As we do look at the Bible, because I think so many times, you know, we, we do look at the Bible and we hopefully view it as the inerrant word, inspired word of God, and that we use it for our lives. But I think it's, you know, we need to look into the background and need to make sure that we see this and understand the importance of it. Because I think one of the things that we really see going on in our society is a dismissal of the Scripture, dismissal of the Bible. Well, of course it was mistakes. Of course there's things in it that's wrong. Because we, again, see this. You know, nobody's going to really sit there and say John 3.16 is wrong. You know, ah, whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. No one's going to come out and say, oh, that was written by a man, so it doesn't really have meaning. Or that was written by such and such, and so I don't like it. You know, no one's going to really complain about that. But there's also people that are absolutely going to complain when wives submit to your husband. Oh, well, it was written by a man, so I don't have to listen to that. <clears throat> that can't be possibly right. If it was written today, it wouldn't say that. I had a person tell me that one time. You know, if it was written today, it wouldn't say that. You know, she didn't see it as inspired by God. She saw it as just writings of man, and that's all it is. And the thing about it is this. If the Bible is just writings of man, then it means nothing then John 3.16 means nothing. And so we see a whole world that's trying to tell us that, a whole world that's trying to push down on the Bible and to get rid of it, to diminish it, to say it's not inspired, it's not the words of God. You make up what you want, do whatever you want, and you'll be okay. But don't worry about John 3.16. Trust that one. That one's right. So we've got to be very wary of this, that it doesn't creep into our own lives. When we're teaching our children, we teach this because absolutely they're going to be taught the other way. They're going to be taught in the world, oh, don't believe in that. Their book is just the same as all the other holy books. Well, it's not. You can look into it and see how it was written, how it came about. It's so much different than all the other books. And so we've got to be very wary of this because when we look at the world, what's going to change the world? God's going to change the world. Uh, the only way we receive salvation is through Jesus Christ. And where do we see that? We see that in the scriptures. All right? So let's have a word. Dear Father, God, Lord, we come before you. Lord, we thank you for the scriptures. Because, Lord, it would be so hard to live our lives if we were just going on our own. If we were just trying to pick and choose what we wanted to do instead of following your word. And, Lord, we know that to be true because we see that in our world today where people look at your word and have dismissed it, have diminished it, have diminished the authors, have you know besmirched their reputations, have done all of these things, all in an effort to try to destroy the scripture. Because the scripture shows us who you are, shows us what is required for salvation, shows us what we are required to do as Christians. And so Lord, help us to always not take it for granted. That, Lord, we would never take it for granted that we would make sure that we look at the scriptures and understand the beauty of what they are and how they changed our lives, how they made our lives better. So, Lord, I pray now that you would be with us, Lord. Help us to hold that high view of scripture and the inspiration of scripture. Help us to live our lives according to the way you would have us to live and not the way the world would have us to live. Lord, again, thank you for your word that is given to us for salvation. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, thank you for joining us this week. Next week, we'll be looking at another aspect of what we believe as Christians and why it is so important to believe it. And again, I hope that you will be with me next week as we'll be here again. Uh, same time, we'll also, of course, be doing the same lesson here live at our church at 630 to 730. And there's always some great discussion. So if you can ever make that, I hope that you can come and be a part of it. But again, I hope you had a good lesson today, and I hope that you'll take a look at your Bible maybe later and see again what beautiful and specialness that comes forth from the Scriptures. All right, thank you very much, and I'll see you next week.